I think we are in the room. Okay, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a fine tradition for the International Law Institute to hold a public event during the course of its biennial session. This year, the Institute is holding its 80th session, which originally was planned to be held in Beijing. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, it has to be convened online. Regardless of this setback, I would like to take this opportunity to express on behalf of the Institute our most sincere appreciation and gratitude to the Chinese Society of International Law for its generous support to the preparations of the Beijing session and for its joint hosting and the financial support for today's event. Today's event is divided in two parts. First, we'll hold a awarding ceremony to announce the winner of the Andrew Bello Prize instituted by J.B. Scott for North-South Relations and International Law. This prize is awarded at each IDI session. After the ceremony, we'll proceed to the public dialogue jointly held by the Institute and the Chinese Society of International Law on the topic International Law and Global Governance, Multilateralism in the Post-Pandemic World. Now I give the floor to the Secretary General of the Institute to conduct the awarding ceremony. Please, Secretary General, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, Madam President. It's a, it is a great honor and pleasure to start this uh, ceremony uh, for the awarding of the James Brown Scott uh, Prize, instituted by James Brown Scott uh, Prize, uh, on the basis of a list elaborated by uh, James Brown Scott uh, himself. Uh, the, pre the prize bears the name of distinguished Jerry's uh, every year, and this year uh, it is the Andres Bello uh, Prize, a distinguished uh, Chilean-Venezuelan uh, jurist who even published uh, uh, his main book on the principles of uh, the law of peoples or Jus Gentium in 1832, and uh, as usual the Institute uh, uh, requested uh, some of our distinguished members to be part of the jury and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, the jury uh, that uh, had a very difficult task as it will be explained uh, in a moment. Uh, it was composed by our uh, confrere uh, Pierre-Marie Dupuis, our consort uh, Jeanette irigoyen Barren, and our confrere uh, Dire Gladi. So, according to the tradition, uh, this uh, ceremony occurs normally <laughs> in different circumstances uh, during a gala dinner, which is organized uh, by the Institute at the occasion of uh, each session. Uh, this time it will be online, and I'm very thankful to everyone because some participants are uh, very early, others are very late. I, I thank everyone and I would like to give the floor to one of the members of the jury who will uh, introduce uh, the winners and uh, explain the manner in which this uh, decision has been taken. Thank you very much. I give the floor to our confrere uh, Pierre-Marie Dupuy. Merci beaucoup, Marcelo. Thank you very much. Um, let me first tell you that, yes, indeed, it was quite a work because we had to uh, go through 18 uh, PhDs and greatest majority of them of high quality. Uh, but um, I speak, of course, first of all for me, but I think that it was our common feeling it was a real pleasure to work together for the three of us with Jeanette and Dire, and we had uh, no difficulties in finding an agreement 
um, the only issue was that we were provided with so many good works and in particular two of them of such a high standard that we considered it as the best solution to award uh, the prize to two persons. And that made it also possible for us to insist of the importance, but that was not the main reason, of maintaining um, a plurilingualism um, within the Institute, and in particular between the two working languages of the Institute, which are uh, English and French. And I should say, chronologically speaking, French and English. <laughs> let me let me start by and, and the two awardees, as you already know, are um, uh, Miss uh, Aladis Ale Nissen, um, and the topic uh, was I, I read out the title, which is complete and should be carefully listened. Uh, because it explains very well, uh, very well the content and the aim of the work, business and human rights, the role of the European Union member states in developing accountability mechanisms for corporations from developing and emerging states. The second awardee is Mr. Baptiste Delmas, and the title of his work is La compétence universelle du juge en droit du travail. Uh, what I think, in the name of my two friends and colleagues, we, I can say, but of course they will be able to correct and, uh, and complete everything I'm just saying, is that the two of those works have much in common um, because the two of them deal with the problems raised by a, a globalized economy. Um, the work of Mrs. Nissen um, is extremely interesting and rich, as is the one of uh, Baptiste Delmas. Uh, the two of them are, I would say, very able and brave people. They were not afraid by the dimension of their research. Uh, in the two of those uh, um, works, you can find a, a comparative approach, including the use of several languages as far as the sources are concerned, and I insist again, this is important. Uh, and also um, uh, an attraction for uh, issues which, once again, are strictly and directly uh, um, uh, connected with the globalization of the economy. I don't want, because I have no time for it, to develop on the uh, uh, content of each of those books, but let me uh, just say, as far as uh, the work of uh, ladies is concerned, that uh, it uh, deals in particular uh, with ILO and WTO regimes, with the problem of extraterritorial obligations, um, and it deals also with this specific branch of the international legal order, and even in some respect, this specific but not autonomous uh, international legal order, regional legal order, which is the law of the EU, in particular as far as competition law is concerned. And um, it is a highly complicated issue, uh, which points to, as we all know, a very crucial element which is to speak in broad terms, uh, uh, cooperation responsibility in the overall international context, in particular for respecting human rights. And here I can see uh, uh, quite a number of uh, contacts with the problematic 
of the uh, uh, work of Baptiste Delmas. Baptiste Delmas euh, s'est concentré sur la question de savoir comment assurer l'accès des euh, travailleurs à la justice lorsque, dans un premier temps, ou pour des raisons de compétence à l'échelle interne ou internationale, ces personnes n'ont pas trouvé cet accès. Et ce qui est très intéressant, notamment dans son ouvrage, c'est qu'il reprend la technique de la compétence universelle. Il insiste à juste titre beaucoup sur le fait que c'est d'abord et avant tout une technique juridique. Il saisit cette occasion pour, je dirais, un petit peu démystifier cette compétence universelle et il montre très bien comment, à la fois du point de vue théorique, technique et aussi comparatif, en prenant des cas d'études, on peut utiliser cette technique de la compétence universelle pour parvenir à garantir l'accès des victimes de violations des normes du travail international, violation de normes internationales, mais aussi retrouvées dans l'ordre interne. Comment on peut garantir l'accès de ces victimes à la justice en ayant recours à la compétence universelle. C'est particulièrement intéressant parce que, d'une certaine façon, ça euh, élargit euh, la perception que les uns et les autres euh, peuvent avoir de l'utilisation de cette compétence. Voilà, je m'en tiens là. Et je serai « I will be very happy if uh, Jeannette and Dire Wall want to complete and even correct what I just said. Let me tell again that it was a hard work, but that it was a pleasure to work with both of you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, uh, our confrère Pierre-Marie Dupuy. Uh, maybe uh, we would like to uh, give the floor to the two laureates uh if they want to briefly address the participants so uh, miss nissen you have the floor first hi everyone hello madam president vice president and members uh, of the jury and of course uh mr delmas congratulations uh, with your prize uh, thank you so much for investing time in my work and in my research. I hope to publish, I will publish it soon. Um, there's nothing as uh, valuable as people investing time in you. And I also think uh, that's what I really enjoyed about this thesis and the north-south dimension of this prize, uh, that I was welcomed with open arms in uh, Kenya by Atiya Waris and in South Korea by Moon Wosik and uh, Yi Yoo Jung. Uh, because they really helped me to uh, make the work better. And uh, yeah, as I said, someone who uh, welcomes you and invests time with you, there's nothing as good as that. Thank you very much and congratulations again. Now I give the floor to Mr. Delmas. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon uh, to every members of the Chinese Society of International Law and members of the uh, Institute of International Law. Thank you very much to the members of the jury to having chosen to uh, uh, award me the, this, uh, this thesis prize. Uh, congratulations too to Mrs. Nissen. Um, I'm fully uh, aware of the importance of this internal, international recognition and I'm very happy uh, that uh, this, this theme of business and human rights and, um, and uh, of uh, international labor law uh, have been important matters uh, for, for the members of the jury. So I'm, I'm very happy. And I hope that we'll have the opportunity to see each other uh, in real conditions. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Delmas, and congratulations again. Uh, I would like to finish just by uh, thanking once again 
the members of the jury for this very important work. And I would like to uh, remember that our next uh, James Brown Scott Prize uh, will be uh, at the occasion of the 150th anniversary of our institute in 2023. Uh, it will bear the name of James Brown Scott uh, himself and the subject matter will be the Institute of International Law itself. So uh, I uh, inform you, laureates, <laughs> uh, if you can also uh, tell uh, uh, other scholars uh, about the existence of this prize and the members of our institute, and I hope the Chinese Society of International Law too, uh, I would appreciate if they can disseminate this information. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, Madam President, thus this closes uh, the ceremony and I thank you for your attention. Thank you again. I, and my warm congratulations to the uh, laureates of the Scott Prize for this year. Uh, it's a great honor and we are ha very happy for you. Congratulations on your academic achievements. Now let's move on to the dialogue be between the Institute and the Chinese society. At the outset, I would like to say a few words about the participants from the two institutions, as we cannot see each other as in a physical meeting. For the Institute side, uh, in French is Institut de Droit International. The Institute is the most renowned learned society of international law of individual membership. It was founded by 11 prominent international lawyers in Brussels in 1873. In, its recognition, in recognition of its promotion of a peaceful settlement of international disputes through arbitration, it received the Nobel Peace Prize in 19. And in, just now the Secretary General mentioned in two years time the Institute is going to celebrate its 150th anniversary. So this time it's really a pity for us, for the Chinese society that we missed the opportunity to receive these, the members of the Institute, these uh, prominent international lawyers in China. For the Chinese society side, I have been informed that about 160 Chinese international law scholars today uh, gathered here. Many of them are council members of the society. Most of them are leading scholars, professors, and senior researchers of international law in China. The Society has also invited a small number of young scholars to the event who have either just started their teaching career or in the postdoctoral studies. This is a group of very prom promising young talents in the field of international law. So that's all for the participants. Uh, the panel today we have is composed of four distinguished international scholars, two from the Institute and the two from the Chinese Society. It's my honor to moderate this public discussion. First of all, please allow me to introduce briefly the four panelists. From the IDI side, Professor uh, Hohen Vinales. Uh, he's from Argentina. Professor Vinales holds the Hauro Samuel Chair of Law and Environmental Policy at the University of Cambridge. Among many distinguished positions he's holding, I would like to highlight just a few of them. He's the Chairman of the Compliance Committee of the UNCC WHO Protocol on Water and Health, the Co-General Editor of the ICSID Reports, a member of the panel of arbitrators of the Shanghai International Arbitration Center and the Director General of the Latin American Society of International Law. The second panelist from the Institute is Professor 
Magosia Fitzmaurice. Professor Fitzmaurice holds the Chair of International Law at the Queen Mary University of London. She is the Editor-in-Chief of International Community Law Review and the General Editor of the book series Queen Mary Studies of International Law. From the Chinese society side, uh, we have also two panelists. One is Professor Jia Bingbing, uh, but now he has just been elected an IDI member. Congratulations again, Professor Jia. Professor Jia is a professor of international law at the Tsinghua University Law School. He is a member of the editorial board of several major journals of international law a member of the Curatorium of the Hague Academy of International Law. The second panelist from Chinese society is Dr. Chen Yifeng, Associate Professor of International Law at the Peking University. He is also the Deputy Director of the Peking University Institute of International Law. Dr. Dr. Chen uh, was a Visiting, visiting scholar at a number of European and British legal institutions, including Max Planck Institute, Lautpart Center for International Law, uh, Stockholm Center for International Law and Justice, Norwegian Center for Human Rights, and he did his postdoc at the University of Helsinki. He's a member of the executive board of the Asia Society of International Law. Now, ladies and gentlemen, warm, <coughs> warm congratulations, a uh, warm welcome to the panel. In order to have a focused discussion, I will divide the dialogue in two parts, as the title of the topic suggests. Part one will evaluate the international, uh, international law in international relations today, particularly pub in public international law. Secondly, we'll consider global governance and the impact of the current public health crisis on the post-pandemic world order. I will first raise some questions to the panel. Each panelist has three to five minutes to briefly address my questions. They have the liberty to ask for the floor again for additional remarks or make a comments on other panelists' statements. I will conduct two to three rounds of discussions on each subtopic before opening the floor to the audience for Q&A session. Hopefully, this Q&A session will last for about 45 minutes. So now, for the first part of our discussions, I would like to uh, present my first set of questions to Professor Fitzmaurice. Professor Fitzmaurice, what do you think about the current status and the role of public international law in international relations, particularly those basic norms such as sovereignty, non-intervention? Are they still relevant? to the existing international legal system. How do you understand the term rules-based order? Um, Other panelists may give their views on these questions later. So Professor Fitzmaurice, please, you have the floor. Um, Madam President, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel and also giving me the first very challenging question. Uh, I understand that we will talk between three to five minutes each, and then our colleagues, uh, panelists, will um, share the views. So, um, of course, the question is very challenging, but I would say that um, in our COVID and still not yet post-COVID era, the basic uh, principles of international law um, still play a very important role. However, I would like to rely on what Ambassador Zhang Jun said 
at the meeting of the um, United Nations about the um, rule of law in our contemporary world. He said, the world is changing, conflicts are also changing in their scope and their, in their nature, and we should also adapt to the new changes. And I think that um, this um, uh, approach, I am very much in favor. I don't have a ready formula how we should adapt or change, but definitely the uh, current uh, challenges of COVID and post-COVID brought new dimension to classical international law. And I would also mention that not only the basic principles of non-intervention and sovereignty, but also the approaches to um, international law as the um, uh, nexus of various rules and regulations based on treaties, customary law principles, we also have to have a um, slightly different approach. And uh, I would like to mention lastly that uh, we talk a lot about the um, this rule-based order and there are many um, approaches to it, many definitions. I wouldn't say that there is one um, definition which would encapsulate um, all the approaches. Um, the, there is a broad definition of rule-based order which would um, include traditional sources of international law but also non uh, legally binding rules like soft law, for instance. And this is something which I think it's worth discussing because not all states are comfortable with um, following um, the nexus of rights and obligations which are not based on, um, again, classical rule of consent. Um, which is, in my view, the basis of international law. So, to kind of sum up what I just said, yes, I believe that the basis of international law still uh, are very current and binding, but we need to look at it and assess it and adapt to a um, post-COVID situation. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I'm not sure we can we can hear you well. I, I apologize. I, I I'll mute. I haven't uh, uh, put out. You know, uh, I'll mute my mic. I, I repeat what I said. I thank you, uh, Professor Fitzmaurice. Uh, you mentioned about the self law and also the element of consent. But for rules-based order, we have to know what rules we are talking about. So, Professor uh, Chen, uh, Chen Yifeng, what do you think about it? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mad thank you, Madam President. I think it is uh, uh, very important that when we look at the uh, rule-based order, that we would see how we have been debating around the concept of rule-based order. I think as uh, Professor Fitzmaurice has correctly pointed out there have been different uh, readings or interpretations about the rule-based order, uh, this term. Uh, on the one hand, there have been reading that would consider that the rules would include not only international law or even soft international, but also include national laws. And then this would make uh, the rule-based order very much a uh, unilateral approach. And uh, what I think that it is very relevant here that when we talk about rule-based order that we would uh, be clear that uh, the scope of rules would be 
including those of international law and not rules of small uh, made by a small group of countries. And I think, and I think this is it is also very interesting that uh, we tend to talk about narrative of the rule based order in contrast to the other possible alternative. I think it is it is important that we see that we often we both we all would agree that there should be rule based order, but we often disagree what kind of rules that we should base our argument and our claims. So I think it is very important to look at what would be our difference about rules instead of saying that we would present ourselves as rule based or not rule based. And I also like to make a further point in this connection. I think when we talk about rule based order, it is very, uh, very much uh, ontological looking towards the rules. And we tend to think that the, the more rules, the better, and the rules would take care of the problem by themselves. And this would, allow, this would often put us in a position that we would ignore or tend to underplay the politics of the rules themselves. And we also would tend to underplay the resources, commitment that we need when we try to implement those rules. So I think it is very important to look at what would be needed for the rule to be operationable. I would like to also remind, uh, introduce the debate that was happened more than 2,000 years ago in China between legalists and the Confucius school. One debate between the two schools is that the Confucius claimed that rules themselves would not be sufficient. We also needed to have those people with virtue to implement the law and to achieve a right end for the society. Madam President, I can conclude my reflections. Thank you. Thank you so much. But Professor Vinyas, I, I, let me ask you this question. Do you think is it possible for us to reach consensus on this term, what the rules we are really talking about? If we uh, have the various concepts on the rules of laws, it certainly uh, by definition is not legal uh, system as it should be. What do you think? Thank you very much, Madam President, and, and, and let me take this opportunity to uh, to say that it's my pleasure and privilege to be uh, to be in this panel and, and to address this audience. Um, I think that the, the the way in which one has to approach the question is uh, by zooming out a, a little bit and, and looking at the at the question of is international law much more routine, much more routinely used in international relations? And I think that the answer is unquestionably yes. Uh, we, of course, tend to uh, look at the topic uh, influenced by a variety of factors and, and current events tend to take a disproportional uh, part of the, of the picture. So if we see that from the perspective of, for example, the situation in Afghanistan and so on, or the situation in, uh, of the pandemic, we may uh, see uh, the, the question and, and, and frame the answer as, 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 as looking at the lack of consensus or the lack of consent or the lack of agreement on how to approach the problem. But the reality, I think, is that in, in a very large majority of uh, the uses of international law right now, and I, mean, I, can, I can think of, for example, uh, uh, international economic law, trade, investment, uh, uh, finance, uh, I think we, we, we are applying much, much more uh, international law than before, and quite routinely, so that the consensus is almost um, uh, implicit. There is, of course, uh, the big issue of whether we're moving to uh, uh, a crisis of values or, or normative foundations of the system. I think that we're still in agreement uh, when it comes to the basic principles. And, and I, when I term the use, when I use the term basic principles, I, I pick the terms uh, of the Friendly Relations Declaration of 1970, uh, which, it, which are really presented as basic principles, and they have been restated in the uh, uh, UN uh, uh, General Assembly Declaration commemorating the uh, 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 75 years of the UN, uh, recently in 2020. Thank you, Madam President. That, that those but, are but my I, I'd like to pick up on what you said about this uh, international law principle declaration. And uh, just now, Professor 
Fitz Morris uh, mentioned that the classical international law apparently will stay on uh, applicable in internal relations, but what we should consider is how can we uh, develop this uh, law uh, to meet new challenges in international relations. Uh, do you think that it's time we should consider the second edition of international law principle uh, declaration? What do you think, Professor Jia? How you, do we need a second edition? Um, certainly, uh, can you hear me, Judge? Yes. yes thank you very much for um, inviting me to join this uh, distinguished uh, panel um, to discuss a very important question. Um, as, as for your question, um, personally, I think there is a great need to update the Friendly Relations Declaration, which has served the whole UN system so well ever since its adoption back in 1970. Um, but I will get on to that um, in the second part, because it, I understand the second part will be concerned with the insta in international organizations and uh, also the doctrine of uh, multilateralism. But here I want to offer two things, two comments on the, uh, the subject for this part of discussion. Um, the first one is that um, international law, uh, as we know it, is the basis for any order of interstate relations. In comparison with other normative sy systems, um, international law has the unique advantage of being relatively objective in content and predictable as to the result of its implementation. And this law was preordained to regulate inter interstate relations from the time of its birth. The dominance of those interstate relations in international life has not fundamentally diminished over the past few centuries. If any, the dominance has been amplified by the emergence of intergovernmental organizations in the 19th century. And going forward, it seems that as long as the basic structure of the West Philian system stays put, international law will remain relevant to international relations um, today and tomorrow. And my second point is on rules-based order thing. Um, I have actually uh, uh, did a bit of research about how many um, treaties we have uh, compiled under the UN um, treaty series up until 2014. I was surprised to know that um, the figure stands at 52,000 treaties, multilateral and bilateral. So if you want a rules-based order, the content of those rules is critical. We have to know what's the content of those rules. But if, at the present, there seems to be no shortage of rules, especially in treaties, in international relations, why do we need a, a new order? I think that there is a lot of uh, um, explaining to do for this uh, new doctrine, if it is a new doctrine. And in comparison, international as we know it, especially as referenced in Article 38, Paragraph 1 of the ICJ Statute, um, is the work of long years of debate and the drafting work of the ILC, IDI, ILA, and above all, diplomatic conferences attended by um, governments aimed at codification and progressive development of international law to meet the challenges of the times. So we have to say international law is already too much, probably, as far as we know. And um, in addition, international legal system as it stands now has uh, ready-made mechanisms for dispute settlement, standing or ad hoc tribunals or courts. I guess um, any new order of rules, any new set of rules will have to beat that level of a maturity for a legal system. But can it do it? So I leave the question open. Thank you very much. But but, but Professor Jia, you really raise uh, you have raised a very good point. It seems uh, no one disagrees that uh, rules-based order should be 
uh, mean that the rules refer to international law. So what is really the difference among states or scholars on this particular concept? What is really at stake? I think that's the, that's the uh, $100 million question for everybody here. Um, we try to figure out what's the content of this rules-based order and especially what's the content for those rules. Because if there is a, such a new order, it means that there were rules and rules in international law. When we deal with the same body of legal structure, we'll talk about two sets of rules. If there's no difference, then the existing international law, probably it's sufficient to cover every corner and every incident at present. For the future, of course, even, even um, the best crafted treaties cannot foresee the unforeseen. So um, I guess there will be a tall order to have a set of rules which can anticipate everything that will happen in 100 years. Given, given this reality, um, I don't see the point to have a, a new order beside the order we have been uh, learning, studying for when we were young and we're practicing when we're getting old. This is the order we know today, which has been in existence for the past 100 years. Thank you. But, but now I, I'm back to uh, Professor, Professor Fismari. offer a thought, uh, just a thought okay. on the question that you asked and, and, mm, and the ahead. point Professor Tia uh, was raising. I think that just to, to give an example of what uh, what part of the picture, which is significant, I would say, is, 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 is missed by our conception of what this order is, is, for example, cities. I was looking at the budget, the annual budget of the United Nations, which is approximately 3.2 billion in 2020. And then I looked at the, the annual budget of New York City, which is 88 billion. And then uh, the one for Shanghai, which is, uh, if my calculations uh, are correct, something like 125 billion. Now, these cities are the same same uh, do currency dollars. <laughs> yeah, in dollars, in, do in, in US oh. dollars. I I, mm -hmm. I I try to move it in in, in different ways. I, I I even thought about using Swiss francs to make it entirely neutral. But the the, the point here was really that uh, I think the the cities regions are missing from uh, uh, not being affected by international law, but by shaping international law. They're not shaping, they're not given a sufficient voice uh, at the formal table. And, and this is very important because I, I was just mentioning those figures because we're only now starting to scratch the surface of what would mean for an international legal order to be much more shaped by cities than by nation states. Uh, that brings back to the very point Professor Fitzmaurice mentioned at the beginning, that uh, apart from classical international law, we know treaties, custom international law, she also referred to, referred to uh, soft law, you know, for the new development of international law. How, how, how you assess that? Fis Professor Fitzmaurice, would you want to uh, yes. supplement your remarks? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, soft law is, a, I would say, an old friend of mine because as Jorge, we share the interest in environmental law and international environmental law has been shaped by soft law, various declarations, and we always say that the stepping stones in an the development of international environmental law started with Stockholm Declaration through the Rio Declaration and now we have Agenda 2030. So I can say that soft law has played always immense um, role in shaping of environmental law. But the question may be posed and um, yes, it did shape environmental law, but how did it shape rights and obligation of states? Hasn't been um, a rights and obligation shaper 
in its own right or perhaps through treaties or through customary law. So maybe it was just the beginning of the long journey to make certain obligations binding. I think this is a question that we don't have a clear answer. Um, this discussion always going on about the formation of customary law. At some point, states say this is norm of customary law, like we have principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration, and then it was um, confirmed by advisory opinion of the ICJ. Um, but um, we have lots of treaties, and for instance, in some of the organizations, and I will talk about it in the second part a bit more, like International Maritime Organization, has based its functioning on various codes, which are soft law. And then these codes were incorporated into global conventions, but states already sort of started to implement them. So the question is, is really a soft law um, a shaper of rights and obligations, or is it a hint for states to start a lawmaking procedure, which takes a very long time to be completed, to make fully um, binding and clear-cut, well-defined rule of law? Thank you, Madam President. I, I, I thank you, uh, but uh, you know, you actually raise uh, another aspect of international law making today, uh, and uh, we uh, now tend to uh, develop international law through, you know, uh, this is soft law approach, and also with multiple players. This is very different from the past. In the past, we only have states, government representatives, and now uh, we have uh, different players. Um, and this is also the result of a, uh, globalization and also with the development of human rights and economic development uh, and individuals' status in international has greatly been boosted. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, one aspect, but hard rules or soft laws, whatever, if it's uh, uh, developed with the participation of all states and the parties, relevant parties, it, it doesn't seem present a problem. So what really the problem with this uh, rules-based order concept? Dr. Chen, I, I get, I'm getting back to you again. Do you have any comments on this? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, I, I would like to uh, make, make two, two comments. Why, why is in response to what Professor Ms. Boris and uh, Finn Alice had just said? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think our contemporary uh, international lawmaking is still very much characterized by the state-centered approach, where we look at state, not at cities, not at the corporations, not at those, uh, you know, experts. And we also need to have the, the threshold of Article 38 to when we look at, when we qualify those rules and law, and then we tend to exclude other body of rules. But I think this, this, this formalism is, is, cost, is, is now increasingly <laughs> and, and challenging today because we see many rules are more effective compared to soft, I mean, soft law could be more effective compared to hard laws. And in the technical area, there are many standards made by NGOs and made by companies could also be more effective compared to those rules made by the states. And I think there is, in, there is indeed a big challenge towards the state control of those standard making in contemporary world. And I think uh, this is one big aspect of challenge brought by globalization. And I think we also need to enrich our understanding of this diversified process of lawmaking. The other point I would like to get back is about the rule-based order. 
I think I think the debate about the rule based order is not is is not that much if we want to have an order based on rules or based on law, but it is very much about who will be able to write those laws. Would that be the United States, Western states, or it would be the developing countries, or be China by emerging states? I think this is probably at the heart of the debate. And the other aspect related here is that the rule-based order is tend to give a, a moral tone here. And if you claim that we are we are advocating a rule-based order, then we are at morally high ground, and in contrast to the others. I think this is really about the narrative that who would take control about the production of the world order here. So it, it has some political aspect to it, but I think from perspective of international law and as international lawyers, I think we could we could agree that we want an order based on international law. And this would be uh, uh, my, my point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, th from there, I'd like to move on. Uh, as you know, with the rise of unilateralism and the populism, globalization has encountered a serious setback. And the effectiveness of international organizations, especially United Nations, uh, organizations, especially United Nations, is being challenged. Uh, and this has a, ne a huge negative impact on multilateralism and the role of international organizations. Uh, and, uh, you know, from our discussion now, I'd like to ask Professor Jia, how do you evaluate the existing multilateral legal system, particularly the UN system? Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Could I just uh, add two things, very small things, to what has been said about uh, soft law? Um, I'm, I'm not against the soft law, but what uh, Professor Fitzmaurice has just said has illustrated clearly soft law, be what in whatever shape and form, we have to go through the mechanism of lawmaking as recognized by international legal system. In, that is Article 38. And secondly, soft law may be very aspirational, but states, if you um, jump onto them too fast and too early, there, there's a risk that if your interests uh, 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 you know, are damaged in the course of the implementation of those soft law, there may not be a place where you can address it. For instance, in front of ICJ, just imagine in front of ICJ, you bring up a, a case alleging violation of a soft law norms. But I, I stop there. I go on to the, uh, the, uh, the question which has just been posed by Madam President. Um, my evaluation of the uh, multilateralism or the doctrine of the multilateralism um, is centered around the um, organization of the United Nations. Um, the organization, even though it was uh, created almost halfway through the 20th century, it has since displayed, displayed remarkable resilience and conspicuous success in fulfilling its mandate conferred upon it by the founders in 1945. In fact, it has been quite successful and resilient for the past 75 years, which is awful long time in international life. Um, the ideals as reflected in Article 1 uh, in terms of the purposes of the organization and the foundational principles as enshrined in Article 2 of the Charter remain pertinent and strong today. Um, so this, this would um, lead me to two comments about the current state of the um, universal um, organization, which is the UN which is the embodiment of a multilateralism as we know it. There may be other forms and maybe other versions, but this is the one we know best. Um, so I, wa I want to make two very small points about the UN. One is the resilience. UN had survived the Cold War, among other things, and many other calamitous events of our times and the years of the past. Um, without going into any details, the creation of a peacekeeping operations in the framework of UN Charter in the UN organization has firmly put the organization in the center of the world affairs. UN was created to stop um, arbitrary use of force in interstate um, relations. 
and the peacekeeping operations contribute greatly to that. In short, of um, using armed forces um, organized and directed by the UN organization itself. And in the 21st century, this appears to be a new trend um, with the organization to um, revitalize itself if necessary. For instance, UN has been organized these um, 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 so-called summit, global summit of heads of a government and the state and other respons responsible representatives of states to work out agenda for action for the immediate future with a certain focus, which I think is quite useful to direct the direction of international relations. And the one of the recent example would be the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was agreed back in 2015 which maps out what UN organizations, but as well as all the member states and all states in the world to do in the next 15 years until 2030. So the agenda basically plans to um, um, end hunger, poverty, um, creating a healthy and uh, um, peaceful environment, and uh, uh, working out a global partnership for sustainable development, et cetera, et cetera. But what I want to, why I refer to this instance is because in the middle of that agenda, there is a paragraph which re, um, states the commitment of all the heads of state and the government, um, their full commitment and the respect for international law. And the agenda, is to be guided by the UN Charter. So that this basically shows what I've said just now about the relevance of international today and as well as the international law-based order, what that means. And regarding the success, there are so many, I, I don't want to go into detail, I just mentioned that 1970 Friendly Relations Declaration, which remains authoritative today which provides um, enriched interpretation of the original per, uh, UN Charter pr provisions and it cements, it reconfirms again, the centrality of the principle of a sovereign quality as enshrined in Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the Charter. Um, according to our confer, um, um, George Abi Saab, who wrote the opening chapter for one of the recent publications organized by my, my, my friend, um, Professor Vinares on the Friendly Relations Declaration. This principle of sovereign equality remains the structural principle and the one and only apparently in the list, in the list contained in Article 2. Um, I have no, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm, I'm merely trying to say that's one opinion um, on this. And in the long term, the shape and form of the multilateralism is embodied by the UN system. And as defined by the UN Charter based law may be affected by new challenges. And how that process unfolds will be worth serious consideration. But so far so good. Um, I, I, I think that will be my, uh, uh, comment for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Jia. I, you're, you're very uh, Chinese, uh, always on the positive side and the courteous, uh, uh, and but not always standing all the achievements, successes of the UN. Apparently, uh, it also confronted a uh, cause for reforms, for, for, for improvement of its functions as we are facing more and more new challenges. Now, how, how do you respond to that, Professor Vinales? You, you're an expert, just now Professor Jia mentioned. How, how you respond to that? How you evaluate uh, the, the current multilateral system and the UN? Uh, thank, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, actually, uh, I, I tend to be, uh, I think that the uh, multilateralism uh, has important days ahead. I think it's going to become, again, more important than in the last 30 years, probably, or important in a new way. 
And this is because, uh, in, in simple, I think that the, um, the liberal uh, sort of order or consensus that, that uh, developed in, after 1990 and that uh, permitted and fostered uh, uh, a specialization, so technicality in rulemaking, uh, has been eroded, has been eroded. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why we're talking about the very possibility of agreeing on fundamental or basic principles. Uh, so I think it's, it's, uh, there is a move, there is a shift ongoing uh, from that uh, level of technicality and technical development of the law towards, again, uh, uh, a more contested uh, way of, of, of handling and, and, and using and relating to international law. And, and, and there, uh, again, what, what Professor Jia was saying is becomes very important because we do have some basic principles uh, to which every state has committed. I'm not saying every entity that is affected by the world order is committed. States and international organizations, but many other entities have not yet committed to it. And the, the, the question there is, is how to uh, improve that order, how to improve that uh, multilateralism, that approach to multilateralism, of course, is a very big question. I, I, I can mention uh, perhaps uh, two or three uh, uh, pistes pour le dire en français. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, one is, is really to make uh, those principles thicker. And by thicker, I don't mean to embed them in this culture, this tradition, or that tradition, but to actually combine the principle with all the law, all the technicality, all the technical development and institutional development uh, that, has, uh, that has taken place under the umbrella of the principle. So the, the Friendly Relations Declaration has seven principles, but uh, in the book that, that Professor Dia was, was, was referring to, we have 15. We have, we have 15 because, of course, the environment was not present. Human rights are mentioned in, mentioned in passing just twice. Uh, international humanitarian law is not present. Uh, the international economic law is not present. And uh, the law of, uh, common, of the commons, of the global commons, which is, by the way, one, one major area of work currently of the Institute, uh, are not uh, directly present, although they are mentioned in the in the uh, in the preface. So in the preamble. So you see that uh, I think that there is some updating to be made, but also we need uh, uh, a new multilateralism that rests on a solid basis. Because if we reopen the Pandora box, it will not be useful. I think we have to we have to work uh, on the basis of what we have already committed to and renew that. So that's my first point on what would be this new. Uh, multilateralism. Another point on new multilateralism would be has to relate much more directly to what in the past could have been said or called transnationalism, which is all these actors, all these players that I was mentioning earlier, uh, that are not getting a formal seat at the table. I'm not saying that everyone should get a formal seat at the table. I, I think that that should be uh, 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 carefully, carefully managed. And the question, of course, is by whom? And hopefully that would be part of the answers that we will uh, uh, develop with uh, the Tenth Commission at the Institute uh, on uh, Distributive Justice and Sustainable Development. But it does need, I mean, multilateralism does need, in order to stay relevant, to engage with that uh, amphibious order uh, that, uh, that, that, that brings out uh, the situations of cities, of companies, uh, of vaccine developers, of civil society, and so on. Uh, a third, uh, a third main challenge is, of course, implementation. And there, if, if, I, if I'm allowed, uh, Madam President, I, I would like just to mention one specific case study, which is uh, possibly quite uh, in point for a discussion of post-COVID uh, recovery, uh, if we really uh, uh, can speak in terms of already being uh, out of the COVID pandemic. But, and that is the, 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 the role of the international health regulations. Now, the international health regulations are binding regulations on all the members of the WHO. Uh, these regulations, they, they can briefly be summarized. I mean, the, the, the latest version is 2005, as, as many, many in the audience will know. Uh, and they, they, can, they can be described very, very simply as having four components. So you have a scope, which is very broadly defined. They apply, they have, they have a all hazards approach. So they, they apply to all sorts of factors, not just two or three, uh, uh, three or four uh, uh, diseases uh, as in the past, 
Then you have a lot of action that is described for the WHO, a lot of action that is described by states, and then processes. Now, there are many problems with the IHRs, many advantages and many problems. One of the problems is that they are not being implemented. Just to give you an example, many countries have implemented forced quarantine uh, uh, schemes uh, in the UK, for example, but in many other countries, there have been uh, implementation of forced quarantine schemes in, in which uh, uh, a traveler has to uh, arrive to the country and pay for a hotel for a, a, a period. Now, that is simply uh, a breach of Article 40 of the IHRs. And no one is, no one is really raising it. Uh, uh, and and it's, 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 it's quite striking. So they are being disregarded, probably because they are not present in the minds of people. Uh, but that is a, a very blatant, a very clear breach of, uh, of Article 40. Uh, so there is a problem of implementation. Another problem that has arisen in the context of the response uh, uh, to the pandemic is the issue of uh, access to pathogens. Uh, so the IHRs, they have a very interesting article, which is Article 6, particularly Article 6, Paragraph 2. And that provision says that uh, after a state has notified uh, a situation that may uh, involve the uh, 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 a public emergency of international concern, uh, the uh, state has to keep uh, um, communicating information to the WHO. The problem is that we're not entirely sure, I mean, it's not entirely clear because it has not been stated in a regulation or in a clarification by the World Health Assembly, whether that includes the sharing of pathogens. And we know that there is another treaty that could collide with that sharing of pathogens which is the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, which applies to some extent, uh, quite largely, uh, I would say, at least to the physical pathogen. And it, it is unclear whether it applies to the genetic sequence. But that tension, that tension has been a major issue, a major, a main, a major bone of contention, and is still in the, develop in the development of, uh, of an actual response uh, to the pandemic. And the third issue, and I will uh, end by that, Madam President, is uh, the issue of uh, uh, the overall focus of the uh, IHRs. Uh, to put it, I mean, I, I'm not criticizing the IHRs, I'm, I'm actually co-editing with two colleagues uh, a full commentary for Oxford University Press on the IHRs, and, and so I, I'm investing a lot of my time in, in these things, and I'm not criticizing them, they are what they are. But what they are is essentially a, a set of regulations that were developed and, and still carry the footprint of a different world. They were developed, they came from the 1850s, and the imprint of the 1850s, which is to keep uh, the, uh, to contain the spread of disease from uh, outside of the metropolis, uh, that imprint is still there. And this is why we have missed in the IHRs something very important, which is the prevention, which is not the prevention of the spread of the disease, but the prevention of the spillover of the jump from a virus that is in an animal to a virus that is in a human. And that is much more about environmental protection and one health. And this is something that perhaps can, can, can uh, be addressed in the uh, discussion on the global uh, pandemic treaty, although there is a lot of treaty fatigue uh, in international these days. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, Professor Vinales, you, you, you've given a very good example illustrating where we can improve the current multilateral system in the field of a public health uh, uh, matters. So, uh, but uh, what you said actually highlights again the central role of states. And, uh, of course, uh, the central role does not exclude the participation of other parties, non-traditional parties. Actually, they are playing a very important role in mobilizing forces, uh, calling, uh, raising public awareness. But down the earth is the states. So, um, but of course, public health uh, system at the both national and international levels, uh, they, they have a lot of problems. At this time, COVID-19 has exposed that, those issues. Now, 
I, I would like uh, uh, to ask uh, Professor Fitzmaurice how, how you uh, see, envisage uh, multilateralism in the post-pandemic uh, era? Madam President, thank you very much for actually bringing the issue of the other stakeholders than just states, maybe. So, in my view, multilateralism um, in, pan, in a post COVID area um, should be more inclusive and more coordinated uh, than just states, but it should also include other stakeholders like civil society, but also, um, well, businesses. And I would like to give the example of the International Maritime Organization, which um, is a, belongs to the family of United um, Nations, and perhaps it's not so well known because it's technical, but obviously protection of marine environment has an in, has a great impact on general health and um, there are over 50 treaties which are concluded under the auspices of the IMO some of them global like convention on protection of marine environment from pollution uh, pollution from ships which is a global convention almost all states in the world are parties to this convention and I would like to say that the way, and of course it has been a little bit criticized, but in the way these conventions and amendments to them come into being, they actually, in, they are very inclusive of uh, stakeholders. In the end, states have the saying that the meetings of the General Assembly of the IMO give a very wide possibility of expressing views by um, environmental NGOs as well as, of course, shipping industry. Although it, um, has gave, it has given rise to some criticism, I cannot imagine that you cannot, that you, um, you can develop convention like MARPOL or London Convention without participation of uh, ship owners and stake owners um, and um, other participants, which actually influence the um, multilateral effect of these conventions. So, I have, um, of course, I think that in order to achieve full multilateralism in relation to for instance, the protection of marine environment, we should really do something more um, in a way of land-based pollution. And this is something which is still, I think, outside the um, paradigm of multilateralism. And it causes, it's 80% of all pollution comes from, um, from the land. And I would like to say that actually MARPOL Convention, which is a very interesting convention, and I, I have to say I, it's my ongoing research, it contributed through multilateral inclusion of all stakeholders into um, reduction of pollution from ships to only 15% of the whole pollution of marine environment. So I think this is a very good example uh, of multila multilateral approach to um, well, international law to inclusion of the stakeholders, but a lot still it has to be done. And that will require a, a recalibration of the, I think, of the objectives, uh, also more coordination, and uh, less fragmentation. And I think this applies as well to particular technical organizations like International Maritime Organization, which I think in a way has been always in a far forefront of 
multilateralist through and also uh, legal techniques and um, necessary involvements of the old stakeholders. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, uh, Professor Fismaris. Uh, you know, Professor Jia, you know, the previous two professors all refer to one important aspect in international law making. You mentioned just now we have a huge number of treaties. If we want to find the sources of international law, we, we, we can find today certainly this situation is entirely different from the days when the Institute was founded. Right? So we have a plenty of treaties to to rely on. But at the moment we face so many new issues. But uh, Professor Vinales mentioned this treaty fatigue. But if you recall in the past decade, compared with the previous decades, very few treaty have been concluded. And if Professor Fitzmaurice also mentioned about this land source pollution to the ocean. How come the states have no willingness to go ahead to conclude more treaties. So how, so how do you envisage this multilateralism in the post-pandemic uh, era? Uh, you know, if uh, states are not willing to go ahead to conclude treaties, how can we develop international law? And we certainly would end up with different assertions there. How do you see that, Professor Jiang? My, my thought is a scattered, basically, because there are, there are too many uh, uh, things um, which have been um, discussed um, by the previous speakers. Um, what I want to say is that, in fact, the multilateralism, multilateralism <clears throat> has been um, included in this 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by the General Assembly as a resolution. So it's, it's, it's not just a declaration or soft law instrument. Um, so um, within, even within that context, you can see the leading role played by states and of course, together with the other actors um, as far as the inmost very technical work is concerned, the implementation of the rules, the codes of a conduct, all the any um, guidelines regarding marine environment will have to go through the government um, ultimately. But I'm not saying that um, there is anything wrong with that picture. There is nothing wrong with it. Um, um, as I said at the beginning, UN organization has been quite resilient. In fact, I want to say the UN organization, in fact, sets the benchmark for all international organizations, as we know. If multilateralism um, in the UN fails, then it will fail elsewhere because, you know, there will be no sovereign equality, which is the basis for this multilateralism. Multilateral, essentially, at the beginning, it means that one state, one vote, right? So you organize the uh, UN organization back in 1945. But, but once that threshold is crossed, it is surmounted by some other means, then you are not going to have an organization based on a very solid principle, which has been tested since 1945. As for the, uh, the, the law, or rather the, the declining figure of treaties concluded, concluded in recent years, I wouldn't say it's a fatigue, uh, Jorge. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the UN treaty series has only managed to publish all the treaties filed up until December 2014, and now we're seven years ahead. So just imagine how many more treaties are, are in the queue. On the other hand, we have. Uh, we shouldn't. We should bear in mind the sacrosanct principle of pacta sunt servanda. Kelsen meant it to be the very foundational principle of international legal system, 
And it's the very basis of the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties. Without that principle, nothing goes. And if states really feel exhausted by crisscrossing with each other, with treaties, with drafts, then they have to think about the long and hard won victory of this principle, Pacta Sunt Savanda. Without that, I wonder what will be left of this international legal order we, we find ourselves in. Um, I think that will be my preliminary uh, response so far, uh, Madam President. Thank you. I, I, I forgot to give the floor to uh, Professor Chen. You have been silent for a while. I apologize. <laughs> that I can't see your image there. Uh, apparently, you, you, you know, uh, this is, you've been listening and uh, how you, your views on this. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. I think the speakers have just raised a range of very interesting issues. And I think uh, my, my, I think the, uh, first of all, I think the United Nations is, system is very, very important. And I hope it will do good in the future as well. And the professor just said it has been resilient, but I, I also have some doubts about the UN system. And it's not, it's not a problem of the UN itself, but it is very much that where we would like to invest the political energy. And if we look at the scene making forum, many of those big decisions are made by group seven, group 20 or OECD. And many economic policy are, lagged, are also not made by the United Nations, but by the World Bank, by the IMF. And many, although the UN has its own peacekeeping missions and has, it, has an article two, po, uh, two, article two paragraph four on the prohibition on the use of force, but we still have many military force conducted by states unilaterally or under the NATO framework. So, so, so my, my, my question is that, or my concern is that if we want to make UN relevant, that it is very much that we would need to make a political commitment and to enlarge the political space that was once created by the United Nations, not to sideline it. And I think, as Professor Jabi mentioned, it has one very important principle about state e equality and that we need to endorse and strengthen the United Nations system instead of weaken it. But I think for many states, especially for power states, they tend to look at look, uh, international organizations as, as a market. So there have been different offers in the market. So if one international organization is more useful or relevant here, then I would like to invest more. And if this international organization is not that pleasant to my view, then I would like to choose another, invest another. So I think it, it, it is this kind of pick and choice uh, pick and choose attitude to make international organizations and also especially United Nations more marginal than it should be. So I think it, we really made it need to make investment in this regard. And I, I agree with Professor Benio Alice that there are many principles that we need to address. This is my second point, for example, about environment, about economic situations. And one big problem brought by globalization is that we, are, we see mostly economic globalization. And the social and environmental dimensions of the globalization had not been properly addressed. And we see the circumstance of the workers in many countries has been, has been uh, weakened. And this, especially in the situation of the pandemic era, I think it also makes their living conditions more a concerning and alarming issue for us. And my third point, I would like to talk, talk a little bit about the international health regulations and the WHO framework. I very much agree with Professor Venuelas that the, when the international health regulations made, it had its historical root in the 1850s, when it had still the colonial legacy, when the Europeans tried to prevent the disease transmitted from Asia to Europe. So it is very much the idea to see healthy to health as a security issue. So the problem is to keep out. And often those diseases happened in the developing countries that conceived to be a threat to the civilized developed world. And if, if you look at those measures at the inter-health regulations, it's mostly about 
warning, reporting, monitoring. And it, it addressed very little until very recently about how to address or enhance the health level and the sanitary conditions in those developing countries. And we tend to see, conceive those developing countries where the disease occurred as a place of a barbarian, place of uncivilized. We tend to blame them and instead of seeing them as victims as well. So I think when we try to develop the internal health regulations for the next generations, and if you want to address the next crisis that we are facing now, like a pandemic, I think we need to do some balancing work here. I know the, I know the Institute is now working on a topic uh, entitled Pandemic and International Law. And uh, Professor Morassi had done admirable work on uh, informally drafted examples through a human rights approach. But I think we really need to look at the need of developing countries and to how to, we would uh, associate the health conditions with economic social development together. And we should not focus simply on separation, prevention, but also how to address their basic health need. And as we said, we would look at how to fulfill the right to health of all nations, not just some, uh, some selective ones. And, uh, and of course, there are also the political economic issue comes in. As Professor Vinu has rightly pointed out, there have been issues, for example, about the sharing of genetic sequences. And it, of course, comes when they relate to the vaccine development and the role of pharmaceutical companies, what is the responsibility, responsibility they should take and what share the developing country might take when they share those genetic sequences and other sources. I think, uh, I think it is very important when we look at the multilateralism for next generation, it's important to be more inclusive and more supportive to the developing world. And I also agree that we should have more voice to those, to those relevant stakeholders including relevant industries and NGOs, and have them play a positive role in that regard. Madam Shri, this is... Madam thank Shri, you, this thank you discussion. so much. Th this discussion is getting more and more interesting. Uh, I, you know, uh, we have such a, a, you know, a valuable audience in front of us. Uh, I would like at this juncture, uh, open the floor to the uh, uh, audience. Uh, to the participants for questions, uh, so we can carry on this uh, uh, interesting dialogue. Uh, I would propose that each speaker uh, please state your name and affiliation, if possible, and uh, uh, indicate to whom your question uh, is uh, directed. Uh, please be succinct and try to control your comments. Now the floor is open. Okay, I see, uh, I think it's uh, Mr. Mr. Zhao Jun has asked floor. I, from the Chinese society, I think. Uh, now you have the floor, please. Please give the uh, floor to Mr. Zhao Jun. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, it's very thought-provoking talks, and uh, I'm a law professor from Zhejiang University. Um, I have a question for the panel. Uh, in order to better promote the global governance, and we see there is a very uh, significant dynamics between international rule of law and domestic rule of law. What is supposed to be the uh, healthy interaction between international law and domestic law? And uh, particularly, I want to direct this question to uh, Professor Chen. Thank you. Mm, okay. Professor Chen, would you like to take the floor? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Zhao Jun. Uh, yes, I think the International rule of law and the domestic rule of law are, of course, uh, closely related. And uh, I do not think that we could develop international rule of law without promoting rule of law in domestic context. So I think uh, I would like to make probably the following two points. One point is that I think international rule of law might positively contribute 
to the domestic rule of law. And uh, this is actually what we are also seeing in China, for example. When China has joined the uh, WTO in 2001, and China had to develop a complete set of legislative administrative rules in order to confirm to the requirement of the WTO in terms of transparency and uh, predictability. So I think it is often uh, one dimension that we could see how international rules have been transmitted into domestic context. And this also goes to other aspects, for instance, in the international labor legislation. Many labor regulations in China are actually developed based on the international labor conventions, ratified or not. And uh, increasingly, we see that direction. But I think there's also another direction, moving another direction. And it is also very interesting to see how national laws, regulations have been molded at international level, and then presented to be an international example, or sometimes as universal rules. And if we look at many of those international law rules, we could see their historical origin in domestic situation. And if we look at, for example, in the human rights case, when we look at the set of political international covenant on political, civil and political rights, they're very much closely associated to the French Revolution and those civil rights uh, and political rights proposed in domestic context. And if we, if we also look at the environmental regulations, we also see the national input. So I think that would be different dynamics, but I also see that it is important that we would look at the international rule of law by contributing different national elements in that process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to uh, uh, Mr. Marcelo Cohen, uh, our Secretary General of the Institute. Uh, Professor Cohen, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, I have a question for uh, my fellow country person, Professor Jorge Viñuales. So he mentioned uh, the relevance of uh, cities in contemporary world. Um, my question relates to the idea of fragmentation because the topic of fragmentation was a la mode, uh, so to speak. Uh, some years ago uh, in the sense of uh, subject matters in international relations. But the problem is that fragmentation can also be achieved uh, through the multiplication of uh, uh, actors uh, or subjects of international law. Uh, that is to say to replace the state by a number of other actors and this this could be the idea of uh, giving a substantial role to cities uh, rather than states. Uh, this would lead to an international community of thousands and thousands of uh, subjects. Uh, this is something problematic, but I would like to know what, what was his idea uh, with regard to uh, the role and importance of uh, cities in international relations? Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, Professor Vinales, would you like to, I think that's a very uh, important aspect uh, I had in mind when you mentioned about the city role. What do you mean by city role? That's the question from uh, uh, Confer. Thank you, Madam okay. ma ma President, yeah. and, and, and thank you. Uh, gra muchas gracias, Marcelo, por la pregunta. Uh, so mm -hmm. essentially, it's it's uh, that's the um, it, it has no single answer. I'm not saying that it has no simple answer. It has no single answer. So uh, in different contexts, uh, the answer will not be the same. And uh, giving a voice and a formal seat doesn't mean that formally cities are becoming subjects of international law uh, with the same uh, scope as states or international organizations. That would be, I think, uh, uh, very, very problematic from many perspectives. So here, my, my own, uh, I mean, perhaps the example that I could give, I could give you two examples, a very practical. Uh, one is uh, the example of uh, climate change negotiations. Uh, in, during the negotiations that led to the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, uh, cities were there, 
but they were not formally at the table. So they were meeting at the Mairie de Paris uh, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the meeting, the formal meeting with state representatives. And of course, the decision of the conference of the parties uh, referred to what was called other uh, non-party stakeholders. So they, they were given some sort of uh, uh, recognition of not, not entirely clear in the Paris Agreement, but in the decision adopting the Paris Agreement. And thereafter, it became particularly important uh, during the Republican administration uh, in the United States, because uh, the United States tried to withdraw. I mean, it, it, it took the steps to do it. Of course, the, 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 the Paris Agreement had its own uh, uh, structure uh, or its own provisions on when that took effect. So in the end, the United States came back. Uh, but the, 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 the situation was that you had many cities there saying, well, we're still in, we're still in. And, and that was something very important. That, that is, uh, in, in that respect, I, I think that something, some more participation was, was missing. I'm not saying that uh, the uh, improved participation that I, I would have expected in that specific case would be uh, useful or even appropriate uh, in all the other realms. That, that's why I say that there is no single answer. The other example, uh, a, a very concrete example, is uh, the, uh, the recent uh, uh, publication in 14th of July of, by the European Commission of a draft regulation on a carbon border adjustment measure. So essentially the EU is saying, well, plenty of countries are producing, uh, in essence, steel and cement uh, cheaper because they are not applying the same level of ambition. And uh, in order to, to stick to the same level of ambition, the EU, uh, the, the Commission is proposing not to include the importers of those, uh, of those products into the uh, European uh, the emissions trading scheme in the European Union, but rather to uh, develop a new regulation that essentially place the uh, foreign uh, products on the same footing because the importers of those foreign products, they have to uh, surrender um, emission credits. I mean, they are not called emission credits, they are certificates, CBAM certificates are called, which are different from the uh, ETS uh, uh, allowances. But they, 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 they are expected to equalize. Now, what am I mentioning the issue of, um, of cities there? Uh, because uh, the uh, regulation, the draft regulation, is saying that uh, certain imports may be exempted from that regulation, from the application of that regulation, if the, uh, 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 they have a carbon pricing system which is linked, linked, and that's a terminology of the Paris Agreement, which is linked, so it, it recognizes mutually, mutually recognized with a European ETS. Now, this linking is not necessarily a state level thing. This linking can happen between the EU and a country, it can happen between a country and a country, or it can happen between the two corporations that are uh, uh, the legal structure of the cap and trade system. So it, there again, uh, of course, the situation is going through the state eventually or through the intergovernmental organization, which is the EU, but what we're seeing is that uh, there is a, a, a sort of international uh, uh, relation which is transnational, in fact, and which is, uh, with the regulation is trying to capture. So I, I guess that in that case, it would be useful to, uh, to clarify the point of, of who can link and what is a valid linking. Okay, finished. <coughs> Has Professor Vinales finished? Yes, my apologies, Madam President, yes. Okay, thank you. Now I, I gave the floor to Mr. Liu Yang. You have the floor, please. Liu Yang has the, the first one on the list. Uh, Madam President, uh, dear distinguished panelists, uh, I have a short question for Professor Vinales. Uh, I think your example on the IHR is a case in point. And as you, as, as you suggested, actually the Article 8 of Nagoya Protocol has a provision addressing the need for public uh, health emergencies. Right? So the problem uh, 
uh, in regards of pathogen sharing in the IHR is a matter of interpretation. Uh, also, we can see it as a region complexity. Uh, those two international treaties supposedly have competing or contesting um, uh, international uh, settings and mechanisms. So my question goes back to your initial observation. What should international lawyers do interpretation. Uh, the other one is more serious, goes deeper uh, to the more fundamental, which I think has something to do with political will of states. Um, so do you think to solve the member states to have a political will to, to, to solve this question, hopefully in a new round of uh, treaty negotiation in this November. Thank you. Okay, I, before I give the floor to uh, Professor Vinales, I will take another question uh, to see whether um, uh, it's also directed at uh, Professor Vinales or somebody else. Uh, now, I give the floor to Mr. Uh, Sun Nanxiang. I have a question uh, to Pro Professor Cheng Yifeng. Uh, my question is related to the function of international law in the changing time of war order, and particularly how international law can shape or affect the behavior of great powers such as those who are Evidence that abolition use the unilateral measures against globalization by the approach of involving national security across, such as in WTO. And so I want to ask a question whether international law or the principle of international law can play a crucial role in the changing era. And particularly, shall we admit that they have authority in law function? Thank you very much. Okay, at the moment I apologize, my my internet connection is not so good. Uh, I hope uh, the uh, panelists have two panelists have uh, heard clearly the questions. Uh, if no. uh, not, you can always ask them to clarify. Uh, Perhaps I will take uh, the th a third question, pick up a third question, and the two professors can uh, have a one minute to prepare your answer. Let me give the floor to uh, this Zhang, Zhang Kang Le. Give the floor to Zhang Kang Le. Uh, many thanks to Madam President and the professors for uh, this dialogue. Perhaps a question to Professor Jia. Uh, so we, we have an overall picture here from the professors. Of, so we have a bunch of international organizations with the UN being particularly working well. We have some treaties, we have states, as Madam President was emphasizing on we have soft law, as Professor Fitzmaurice was talking about. Uh, so we have all these things, and at the same time, we seem to have all sorts of issues arising at the global arena, which is the reason why we're still debating this. So we, we have, uh, for example, the uh, climate change, uh, refugee issues, and all this. So I'm, I'm just curious about what you think in terms of what we should do uh, here. So. Professor Chen Yifen seems to 
be suggesting a kind of paradigm shift in terms of how we think of international law or how we should international lawyers should be approaching various issues. Professor uh, Vinales seems to be suggesting that we should be paying attention to new uh, areas, new actors, and so on. So I'm just curious, what do you think uh, in terms of how we should be approaching or coping with the uh, rising issues and some long lasting issues that are facing the global society that are uh, creating all sorts of chaos uh, at the moment? Thank you. And thank, thank you, you. thanks to Madam President. Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to Professor Vinales to address the question and then to be followed by uh, Professor Chen. Professor Vinales, you have the floor now. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, I had a little problem. I mean, the, the, the question was breaking up a little bit, but what I could understand uh, was whether, uh, I mean, what, what were my thoughts uh, on the connection between the Nagoya Protocol, particularly Article 8 on the emergency, the, the emergency aspects of access and, and, and the IHRs on, and more generally on the sharing of pathogens for the purpose of developing vaccines, for example. Uh, now, uh, on that point, I think the, the, the key question here is, is, uh, is not necessarily the access, but the benefit sharing. And uh, the, uh, the reason why access may be uh, complicated is that benefit sharing needs to be negotiated. And there are different systems to negotiate that benefit sharing. I would say that there are three main systems. One which is the one that is followed by the Nagoya Protocol, which is bilateral. So it is, although the Nagoya Protocol tries to uh, standardize that bilateral negotiation, it, I mean, the, the contracts that you find in practice, uh, they change from state to state, and that creates uh, pretty much a headache for people trying to get access particularly the scientists and particularly those who not, are, are not entirely sure whether the, uh, the, uh, the uh, pathogen will be uh, 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 or the genetic resource will be uh, uh, useful for developing a vaccine, for example. But uh, that's, that's one system. The problem of that system is time. It's time and inconsistency. The other system is a system of the International uh, Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources uh, uh, of 2001 in which you have a multilateral system. So the resources are there you can access them and you know what the terms will be. So it's like a market. You, you go to the marketplace, you access them, and you know what the terms will be. And if you don't like the terms, well, you just don't go, but they are ready, readily available. The third system, which is something that has been developed in the specific context of the WHO for uh, influenza to develop constantly uh, 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 responses, uh, vaccines to, uh, against influenza, is what is called the PIP framework, which is uh, the... Uh, which is, which is a, a regulation in a way, not technically uh, uh, in the terms, it's a decision of the uh, World Health Assembly that organizes a system whereby that sharing is constantly made and financed by the selling of vaccines. The key there is the fact that um, there is a, uh, an expectable, an expectable um, uh, demand for the vaccines. So that expectable demand can be calculated in advance and will feed the system. In the case of the, of the COVID, that issue was uh, uh, a bit complicated because uh, if you set up a system for a specific virus, uh, then what, happen, what happens when that virus is no longer there or no longer there uh, in a pandemic manner or in, in an epidemic manner, actually? Uh, and how do you develop a system that captures the, uh, the entire reality? So, the reality, the main reality, which is sonotic disease. So uh, viruses that are in animals that are spreading to humans through uh, an intermediary a vector species. In this case, there is a lot of talk about uh, whether it was a pangolin or not and, and, and how this virus came to be, I mean, how the pangolins came to be there and so on. So the, the, uh, the matter is not just a matter of interpretation. You could adopt a decision in the context of the Nagoya Protocol, that would be authentic interpretation. So the parties of the Nagoya Protocol could say that uh, emergencies, access to pathogens in cases of emergencies, particularly with a FIC, which is a, a public health emergency of international concern under Article 12 of the IHRs, uh, has been declared. Well, in those cases, the uh, access and benefit sharing would not no longer apply or would uh, revert to a sort of fallback system which is multilateral, 
So all those things can be thought of. You can even think about clarifying uh, Article 6.2 of the IHRs by um, uh, a resolution of the World Health Assembly, which is a body that is entitled to interpret authoritatively. And that would be what you would call in, 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 treaty, in treaty law, uh, subsequent practice or a subsequent agreement. This Article 31, uh, uh, 31, uh, 1, uh, 31, 2 A and B, if I recall well. So it, it's, it's really, it can be done if you get the votes. <laughs> if you get the votes. Uh, and this is what you're not getting in this, in this context. Uh, and, and that's, that's the, main, the main challenge so far. But I, I completely agree that it could be done by clarifying what is already there. Thank you, Madam, Madam President. I thank Professor Vinales. And now, uh, if uh, Professor Fitzmaurice would like to ask anything, just indicate. I can see you. Uh, and before I move on to the next question, do you want to add anything? I would like to add, perhaps I was thinking about sort of linking several questions about also states, international or national law. I find it very interesting. And um, of course, I want to go back to what Professor Gia said, Pacta Sum Servanda, the Grundnorm, um, how to make it global that states really follow up the um, treaty obligations, let's say. How, how can it be done? And it also basically relates to the question about relationship between international law and national law. And I would like to um, to mention that they are actually techniques within international organizations like this one I mentioned, IMO, where, which actually enable states to participate in development of rule of international law without imposing um, um, the rule without its consent. And I would like to, in particular, highlight the, um, the um, institution of uh, tacit acceptance, because I think that this is a very good rule in a development of a amendment of an informal amendment of a treaty to um, comply with the uh, growing exigencies of globalists also and uh, for instance environmental um, threats um, without um, going through the whole amendment procedure and giving also a state um, right not to be uh, not to consent to certain new developments and I think that this is a very good um, system within the uh, global approach to the rule of law, the rule of treaty law, um, to on one hand give the opportunity to international global treaties to develop, on the other hand to preserve the equality of states and give them the um, choice on not to be bound by certain norms. So I think I would like to highlight this in relation to um, um, global international lawmaking and multilateralism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chen, would you like to pick up your question now? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, also, thank you for the question from Professor Sun Nanxiang. When you raise the question about whether international law can uh, deal with the national security issue. It's, it's very interesting. This reminds me the, the seminal piece written by Hersh Lahpat on the function of law in international society. That was a piece written in the 1930s. And one of the issues in, in his book was that whether international law could deal with those arbitration and judicial proceedings related to national honor and vital interest. And, uh, and now it, it has uh, taken a new form whether the national security issues can also be dealt with by international law properly. And increasingly, we see in recent years, actually in recent decades, that the states try to appeal to the notion of national security and try to exclude those matters from the province of international law. But it, it, it is not necessary if we look at those economic fears, that is the national security uh, issue is still governed by those investment treaties. 
and of course, in the in the, in, the, in the other field of international law, there have been less rules covering those subjects. But I think it is also the 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 responsibility for international lawyers to try to expand the applicable scope of international law to those uh, contested fields. And even when we look at the national security, it could be issues of human rights, could be issues that deal with with internal trade, investment, environment, and there will be readable uh, there will be a a group of rules that could be readily ap applicable in those new situations. But I agree, this poses challenges to international law. And uh, this, these challenges are, are real. And uh, for example, in, in, in the case of the United States, we see now a group of scholars engaging in, in, in national security law, in foreign relations law, and there have been different ways to approach those issues, to try to situate those issues in different uh, legal vocabulary, legal form, and that presents real challenge to international law. So I think, uh, I, think, I think it is also a moment that we need to reassert our relevance, the relevance of international law and uh, try to expand our competence in those fields. And that's, I think, a real task for us here. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you. Any comments on this? Further comments on this? Okay, and then I give the floor to Professor Jia uh, for mm -hmm. your question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, um, I want to address the question uh, uh, from Dr. Zhang. Dr. Zhang is from Peking University Law School, by the way, and I think he's a postdoctoral student. Um, international law is embedded in the, uh, um, let's say, the fabric of international life. It's part of the life. It's not whole of the life, even though I, I, I trust some international lawyers try to see it that way. Um, so law can only do what law can do. That's my answer. You can't expect international law to solve every problem that arises on the horizon, such as the pandemic. It came out of the blue, and you expect that there is a rule there meeting head on with the pandemic. That's not the way the world runs. International law has its own function and a mandate. Once you have a political uh, com commitment, and that commitment will have to be, sometimes will have to be in couched in, term, in legal terms to make it binding. Like the emission targets uh, in environmental law. If you have set the targets of emission for this and that state, and you know full well beforehand this or that state cannot meet the commitment, then what's the point to talk about it in the first place? But once they give you the, the word, you could say the word in legal terms, which will create legal consequences. If the emission target is not met and transboundary um, um, pollution happens between the two countries, there is a question of international responsibility. If you can't get air cl uh, cleaned <clears throat> by the other country, by the polluter, you could at least get some compensation. I think this applies even in domestic um, law context. You can't get everything back to normal, you will get some compensation instead. I think that's the solution provided by international law in this particular situation. And as far as what international lawyers do, international lawyers do what they do at the lawyers. Again, they deal with um, clients from governments, from companies, from individual, from NGOs, but all by reference to international law. They're the experts in this field and that's their work. So they will meet the question from the perspective of lawyers. I hope I have a, a addressed part of your doubt about the subject. Thank you. Okay, um, I think I'll take one last question from uh, Dai Ruijun, the second, uh, uh, Dai, Dai Ruijun, okay. Please indicate your affiliation. Yes, good. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, my name is Dai Jun from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. 
Uh, my question, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much, all the uh, professors. And my question is brought to Professor Fitzmaurice. And uh, uh, yeah, to pr pr Professor Fitzmaurice. And I also welcome other professors, if you would like to make some comments, please. Uh, my question is about the uh, fragmentation of international law. Uh, when we talk about the fragmentation, we always uh, mention about the different subjects, maybe uh, some rules or conflict with each other in different subjects of uh, international law. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the pr uh, fragmentation will also happen in a specific area, uh, even uh, for uh, a specific treaty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remembered um, uh, Professor Fitzmaurice uh, mentioned that uh, for the new era, we may uh, we may need more inclusive. Uh, all the stakeholders will be uh, welcome to participate in the global uh, governance. So, um, um, I mean, the, maybe in in these circumstances, there will be some challenge. Uh, for example, uh, I will take an example in the field of human rights. Uh, as we all know, the human rights uh, treaty bodies, the experts, uh, expert body established by the uh, treaties, uh, they thought they have the full power and the duty to interpret the human rights. And beside, but when, when some uh, disputes arise from the human rights treaties, uh, the, state, the state parties may brought it to the ICG, and ICG, of course, will make their uh, interpretation of this treaty. And beside this, the state parties also have the duty, have the capacity and have the right to interpret the human rights treaties. But, uh, but when, if there is some conflict between these different interpretations, actually, it, uh, in fact, it, ha it ha already happened uh, recent, uh, recently. For example, uh, the, the case Qatar versus the United Arab Emirates. Uh, which was brought um, about the application of international um, I ICERT, I mean the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. The ICG and the treaty body have different interpretation about this, um, about uh, a, a, a rule of this treaty. So, I mean, if there are many uh, stakeholders, all the stakeholders could have their uh, have a rule in the in the in the uh, um, in the global governance, and if there are uh, some conflict, so who will make the last decision? I mean, currently, with uh, at least we have the uh, we have the principle of state consent. Uh, but if so, but uh, my question is, how could we cope with the uh, the, the fragmentation that might be? Uh, caused by so many um, subjects, so many stakeholders. Uh, I'm not sure if I have it quite clear. Yes, yes, you, you have made yourself quite clear. Uh, now well, I give the floor to uh, Professor Fitzmaurice. Well, thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much, Madam President, and for your question, which obviously we could write a book about it right now. Unfortunately, we don't have time. Um, I may actually go back to uh, pro what Professor Gia said, that international law is just law, and we have to put up with various courts and uh, tribunals which sometimes give contradictory decisions. And I would, like to, I would like to go back to classical case of international law, Nicaragua case, when we had the pronouncement, the judgment of the ICJ, and also the judgment of the um, former uh, criminal tribunal for former Yugoslavia on um, what is the control. And the judgment, the decisions, the approaches of ICJ and ICTY were different, were completely different. And um, we really uh, need to acknowledge that there is no, uh, of course, ICJ uh, is ICJ. We know what's the role of the ICJ, but all courts and tribunals 
can interpret law in a different way. We cannot avoid it. We have to live with it. Um, so uh, this is the fragmentation which, of course, uh, cannot be avoided, although I have to say that many courts and tribunals try to now unify what um, when they make a judgment and um, try not to um, be too, um, too different from the predecessor. However, I always think about the Nicaragua case and we cannot avoid it. They were different interpretations of the same control. Um, now, another issue of fragmentation is uh, obviously interpretation of particular treaties and um, this comes up uh, very often before the international courts and tribunals where the article 31, uh, 31 um, paragraph C can be used as a unifying tool for um, a unifying tool for interpretation of treaties and that is very often on the agenda of international courts and tribunals for instance in the whaling case judge um, Cansado he uh, mentioned this article in relation to interpretation of the whaling convention uh, Cansado Trinidad in, in interpretation of the whaling convention in relation to development of conventions um, newer conventions like convention on biological diversity so this is one tool for um, avoiding fragmentation in international law so basically we have to look in from two points of view one point of view of international adjudication where they will be different uh, interpretations uh, in different courts and tribunals um, we should also not um, forget about um, uh, uh, investment tribunals and other tribunals and courts which make uh, pronouncement on the basis of international law and interpret for instance liability for environmental damage I have seen a lot of judgments in this respect, which uh, were comp which were quite different from each other. And we also have to remember that these days, lots of courts which were uh, set up, for instance, particularly like European Court for Human Rights, for um, European Convention of Human Rights, but these courts now make decisions which encroach on other areas of international law and European Court of Human Rights on the basis of Article 8 makes pronouncement relation to in international environmental law for instance and what is the harm in relating to environmental law by based on Article 8 so we cannot uh, avoid different approaches due to expanding area of international adjudication and expanding number of international courts and tribunals. Thank you, Madam President. I, I thank all the panelists uh, and this is a very uh, rich and intriguing discussion uh, but uh, time uh, is limited, we cannot afford to go on. I would like to uh, thank all the panelists uh, and the participants for joining this dialogue and sharing your valuable thoughts on these important issues. Um, I would say uh, through the discussions uh, we share the view that the basic norms of public international law as enshrined in the purpose and the principles of the UN Charter are still relevant and will remain relevant in international relations. Uh, the UN system remains the basic legal framework of the world order. Uh, notwithstanding its achievements, its contributions to the world peace and security and to the international development, the UN system has to be further developed 
and reformed so as to meet growing global challenges. The COVID pandemic has left many lessons for us to learn. It reminds us that regardless of our differences, we share the same destiny and the many common interests. To promote mutual understanding and trust among peoples, we will continue our dialogues and exchanges of views. International law can serve as our common discourse. So, at last I would say, inspired by the Olympic spirit, let us join our hands to promote a better and a stronger world together through international law. So uh, with that, I will close this public event and I wish each everyone continued good health and safety and uh, uh, all the best and thank you very much. So this public event has come to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. The meeting is over now. <laughs>